Don't mind me. Before we jump into the sermon, a um, couple of things. I want to just remind you what Jenny said is really true, that your generosity, I think sometimes in a church, our size with the number of campuses, the number of programs, it can feel like, well, what difference do, does my giving make? It makes a tremendous difference. You heard a few of those things, VBS, midweek programming, uh, here and around the world. Let me tell you one little story that, about something God is doing in our church family that you might not know about, but it's, uh, it's worth telling. You'll see an image here on the screen. This is Pastor Danny Flores of R, the letter R Church uh, in Elgin. He's a converged pastor. We've become good friends, uh, brothers in the Lord, and I'm excited about what God is doing there, reaching uh, Latino families uh, by the hundreds, and um, really excited to see how God is using his efforts. And this is actually outside of our South Street campus because we are partnering with this church to launch a Spanish-speaking service at our South Street uh, campus called Capilla, which is the Spanish word for chapel. You'll see another image here of the, this first. They had their last month had their first service. We partnered with them. There were close to 100 people there worshiping. And I've got to tell you, the worship was just powerful to be in that room. If you have a chance to come by and visit and join in, you'll see another image here of after uh, Danny and the people that were there worshiping. And then afterwards, they fellowship together. Uh, the, it, it, unlike, uh, unlike us here, we worship and then you leave. Like you go out the door, bye, see you, see you next week. They hang around and talk to each other and enjoy each other and, uh, and enjoy food together. Last Sunday, Capilla had an outdoor service at our South Street campus. That, by the way, para todos y para donde estes, means for everyone, for where you are. Sound familiar? We're partnering together with them to launch this service, reaching people from our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, clients there, people that they're already reaching, which don't want to drive all the way to Elgin, and from our own church family and community. So I encourage you, June 25th is the next Capilla service at our South Street campus on that evening. And uh, a couple more images of the outdoor service that they, they had there. I got to tell you, their, their, their team, uh, we're excited to see what God will do as our church is partnered together to reach more people than we could if we were separate from that. Um, and they know how to party as well. <laughs> and their food is better. Yeah, right. So pray, pray, for the, pray for what God is doing. And I just want you to know that because when you're generous to the work of God here, you know, I know you, you, you write a check or you give online and you just trust God with that. He's using that to do things that collectively we could not do if it wasn't for all of us together. He multiplies our generosity and reaches people uh, through that. And we're excited that you're a part of that. I want to tell you more of those stories. So again, June 25th, the evening of uh, June 25th, Sunday night at our South Street campus. Stop by and worship with Capilla. Even if you don't know Spanish, You'll know the language of worship as they praise God together. It'll be great to be together. All right, a couple more things. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, uh, which is um, the time when we as a country remember uh, the price that was paid for our freedom, many who have served. As followers of Jesus, we thank God for our freedom, relative freedom in this country. But that also reminds us that our ultimate freedom, our true freedom, was not purchased on a battlefield, but at the cross. So we have a, a dual memorial this weekend as followers of Jesus. It's good and right that we celebrate our nation, but it's also more, right, more appropriate that we remember who our freedom truly lies in, Jesus himself. And this past week has been a challenging one for our church family. I mean, I, I, all over the world, every day, there are tragic things that happen that often we're, we're distant from. But for those of you that know, and maybe you don't, that um, one of our staff members, Alan Cavender, 59 years old, worked on our facility staff, beloved friend, brother in Christ, a member of our staff, passed away suddenly of a heart attack just a few days ago. So our prayers are with Laura, his wife, and their children, and we miss him already. And Pastor Andrew Griffiths is right now across the pond for his mother's funeral. She's been dying of cancer and finally went to be with Jesus, and he's there grieving with his sister and his, his UK family. And then some of you have been following the news and you know that Emily White of Batavia, mother of five, was hit by, riding her bike, was hit by a car. Emily and her husband David and their children were part of the Mill Creek campus family that she, um, she passed just a few days ago. There's a lot of heavy things. And so we know again that God is sovereign and he sees every tear and he hears every cry and he's present with us in our sorrow and our grief and in our joy. And as followers of Jesus, those things go together often. So I just want to take a minute and pray together as a church family for all of these things before we jump into his word. Father in heaven, we have so much to be thankful for 
At the top of the list is your grace, which is sufficient. We thank you for our nation. We pray for your will to be done in our nation's leaders. We thank you for the freedom that was purchased for us at the cross. We thank you for your church, which we get to be part of by your grace. That it's not something we just attend once a week. It is your people gathered by the power of your spirit under your name to proclaim who you are and to do your work in the world. And as a church family, we're hurting a bit, Lord. We ask for your grace and comfort for the Cavender family, for the White family, for the Griffiths family, and for us as a church family. You would remind us that death is not the end, that what you accomplished on the cross and on Easter Sunday have purchased for us a victory beyond this life. We thank you and we praise you. We help, ask you to help turn our minds to your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, uh, Dr. Danny Strange, Dr. Strange came and preached to us a message on Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If you missed that, go back and watch it online. It was excellent. He talked to us uh, about a number of things. And one of the things he said was the secret of having your spiritual battery fully charged is to stay constantly connected to the truths of the gospel. Do you remember that statement? We, we disconnect ourselves, so we need to be reconnected. And that's part of the reason why we're memorizing Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Perhaps you thought I forgot about that. Well, I didn't. <laughs> Right? Anybody got it? Today's the day. Who's ready? No takers? Let's do it together. Let's stand together and recite. You can, it'll be on the screen. Cheat sheet for you on the screen. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, the word of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things on heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is God's word. You may be seated. It's worth memorizing uh, those things because it takes repetition. And repetition gets it from our minds into our hearts. And we, whether or not you can say it perfectly, it starts to fuel, inform your thinking the way you think about who you are and who he is. My kids are all grown now, but when they were young, there were many moments like this. That's Noah and Hannah. They're in their mid-20s now. And that's not Halloween. That's just an average uh, day in our, in our house, you know, <laughs> playing firefighters, you know. I remember those days. I miss those days. We don't do that as much anymore. It'd be weird when you're in your mid-20s to dress up like firefighters. And you'll see this image here. This is my youngest son, Ben. This is a character we invented together called Duct Tape Man. I made that costume, very proud of that. Again, not Halloween, just a day in the life of our, with lightsabers on the floor there. It's fun, kids like to dress up. They dress up to pretend they are something that they're not, right? They, they get into this world because they're wearing the clothes, they think they are the thing that they're dressing up as. And by the way, adults do this too. We also dress up to play the part. You'll see an image here of me and Pastor John Kelly, who you know. I, I, this is my second time fly fishing. This is his first time fly fishing. We look like we know what we're doing. We do not. We hooked each other more than we hooked fish. We tangled our lines, and our guide was very patient with us. But we, we bought the gear. We got the waders on. I bought the hat. I wanted, I wanted to look like a fly fisherman, even though I'm not. I aspire to be. I think in our culture, we think it works this way, right? You dress a certain way. You promote a certain image on social media or your clothes and, and, and you wear the outfit so that you can be that person. We think it works from the outside in. I can create an image, decide who I am, and project that to the world. But that's not how it works according to the gospel. That's fundamental to what we're going to talk about this morning. Your fundamental identity something, is not something you can create. 
You can't discard your identity like old clothes and put on a new identity just because you choose to. Look at verses 9 through 10 of Colossians chapter 3. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul is saying this is something that has happened to you in Christ. You have put off and put on. You are no longer who you were. You didn't choose it. It happened to you in Christ. You have died with Christ in chapter 2, verse 20. You've been raised with Christ in chapter 3, verse 1. At the same time, this new self is something that has happened to you and is happening to you. He says, is being renewed after the image of its creator. So you have a new identity that has happened and is happening, ongoing. This sets the stage for what Paul says next in chapter 3. Let's read our whole passage for, for this morning. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Another passage worth memorizing once you finish verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1. So the key here to understanding this whole passage, this whole idea, Paul uses this language of putting on, You have put on the new self, so put on these things. He's using clothing language. Every day you get up and you get dressed. You decide what to wear, right? You you put certain things on based on what the weather is going to be, what your agenda is for that day. He's using that kind of language. But the key before we get to what you put on is a new identity. We talk about this a lot around here because the gospel talks about it a lot. You've been given a new identity. It's been conferred on you. You didn't create it. You didn't develop it. You're not projecting it on social media. It came to you in Christ. This is the starting point. Your new identity. Something has happened to you. You are not the same person. You have died. You have been raised. And your life, as Paul says in Colossians 2, is now hidden with Christ in God. Look at verse 12 once more. A new identity. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. This is your new identity. These three words encompass what it means to have a new identity in Christ. We put on what he's going to tell us to put on, compassion, hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and all these things, because we already are new in him. I want to talk through these words. Chosen. I can remember, remember the, if you were in grade school in my era or before, we used to, I don't know if I do this anymore because nobody can be offended, but they used to, we used to pick teams. Remember that? Getting chosen. It's a big deal to get picked. Made you feel horrible if you weren't picked. If you were, that feeling of, oh, they want me. The gospel is God chose you. He picked you. You. He wants you. He chose you. He sees you. He loves you. She's mine. He's mine. Think about what that means. Jesus says, you did not choose me. I have chosen you. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundations of the world, he chose us to belong to him. You're chosen by God. Second, holy. You're holy, he says. Now you might think, ah, you don't know my life. You don't know my thoughts. Holy can have two different meanings. It can mean perfect, as God is perfect, and it can mean set apart, as we are set apart for him. When we're told here that you are holy, it doesn't mean you never sin, you never screw up. It means God has chosen you and set you apart for his purpose for his agenda, dedicated to him. 
You may, you may have a space, we call it sacred space or a, a place set apart for the work of the Lord or for the worship of God. Your life is meant to be that. God chose you and said, I'm, I'm setting this one apart for my will and for my work. Doesn't mean you always get it right. It means that's what you are in Christ. And then last and probably most important, beloved, beloved, you are deeply loved by God in Christ. He loves you deeply and dearly. Remember what, what does God say, the voice of the Father, when Jesus comes out of the Jordan River at his baptism. Do you remember this scene? The, the image of the dove, the Holy Spirit appears above him and there's a voice from heaven saying what? This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Do you know that if you're in Christ, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you belong to Jesus, that same voice of the Father speaks over your life. This is my beloved daughter. I'm pleased with her. This is my beloved son. Chosen, holy, beloved. Trying to put on the new self in Christ, trying to be a better Christian, to put on all the things Paul's gonna talk about without knowing your identity is exhausting. It will, it will, it will ruin you. That's dead religion. There's no life there. Everything flows out of this identity that has been given to you by the grace of Jesus. Chosen, holy, beloved. And Paul, by the way, is echoing Old Testament language here. This is exactly how God talked about his people, the Israelites, the chosen people, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you. You notice that? Why does the Lord love you? Why does he love you? Because he loves you. Why does God love you? Because he loves you. That's who he is. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You're not all that lovable, quite frankly, on a human level. You're not all that good looking. You're not all that talented. But he loves you because he loves you. And there's security in that. Because if you could earn his love by your achievement, your accomplishment, your goodness, then you could lose his love by the lack of it. But neither of those things are true. You don't earn it, you can't lose it. He loves you because he loves you. Where was I? Yeah. And as keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He's saying to these people and to us, Paul's saying, that's true of you, my people. If you're in Christ, God chose you. You're wholly set apart for him, and he loves you. Like when I look at my little kids on that screen, and moms and dads, you look at your kids, and you, it's hard to quantify how much you love your children. That's a fraction of what God feels about you. Now, here's how the late Timothy Keller puts it. He passed away, a great loss to the church, but a gain to heaven. He, was a, he had a profound impact on my life and ministry, although I never actually met him. Here's what he writes. He famously said this repeatedly in different places. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Both are equally true. You're worse than you want to admit to yourself. You want to rationalize your sin. But because of Jesus, you are chosen, holy, beloved. More loved than you ever dared hope. Everything flows from your new identity in Christ, especially the commands that come next about things we should put on. You're not trying to dress like somebody you're not. You already are this person, Paul says. So dress like it. You ever, I, I can remember my mom saying to me, you're not going out of the house looking like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> I washed this t-shirt last week. Therefore, Paul says, put on these things because this is who you are. Second thing, from new identity, new clothes. New clothes. The language Paul uses here in Colossians 3 is the same as that I've used for getting dressed, taking off, and putting on. He's telling us what to put on. This is the positive aspects of following Jesus. I think sometimes we think Christianity is just the stuff we're supposed to put off. Put off, you know, slander and evil talk and lustful thoughts and impurity and drunkenness and, and deceit and hatred and racism and bigotry and all the things we're supposed to put off, put off, put off, put off. Like Christians are just about... No, Paul says, I want you to put on certain things. 
to dress like the identity that I've already given you with your character and your conduct. Look at verses 12 through 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, there it is, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We'll talk through these, these things we're to put on here for a moment. Compassion hearts, the deep sense of mercy, care, and compassion for others. In Matthew chapter 9, we're told that Jesus looks out at the crowds, and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion for them. The word compassion there is the Greek word splagnizomai. It's fun to say. It literally means like a, a feeling in your guts. We say this, right? I feel it, in, I feel it like I have a gut feeling. It, it literally means the word for compassion, biblically speaking, is a deep feeling, inner feeling of, of mercy and compassion for somebody. The absolute opposite of cold indifference. In other words, if you belong to Jesus, you're not allowed to be indifferent to people's suffering. It's not okay for us to be, to be like, oh, well, that's not my problem. We should feel deeply, internally, someone else's pain. Care for them, do what we can, by God's grace, to help them, to come alongside them. I fall short of this. Maybe you do as well. But Paul says, put on compassionate hearts. That's how God feels about you. That's how he calls you to feel about others. And then he says, kindness. This word actually refers to a wine that had mellowed with age, lost its bite, its bitterness, and its edge. It's such a rare quality today. Kindness. Pastor John Bechtel often says, to hold one another in high regard. To think kindly about each other. To believe the best about one another. To speak and act with kindness toward each other. Does that happen very often on Twitter? In your experience? No, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a digital version of the opposite of kindness for us. To be hateful and spiteful, decontextualized, no face-to-face -face interaction, but I can just say whatever I want behind the screen about people. We don't see much kindness today. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, there's this great story about King David. David, you know, and, and Saul were uh, rivals. David didn't want to be, but they were rivals for a time. And they, their families had tension between them. And David asked the question long after Saul has passed, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I could show the kindness of the Lord to? And one of his servants says, well, there's one son of Jonathan, a man named Mephibosheth, and he's crippled. David says, bring him here. And he, sh he lavishes kindness and grace and generosity on him. The kindness of the Lord. I think about that's what Paul is saying. If you're in Christ, you're chosen, holy, and beloved. So live with compassion for people. And as you have the chance, look for opportunities to show the kindness of the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question. Which do you think has been more responsible to, of, for winning people to faith in Jesus? Argument or kindness? Which are you better at? I remember a young man when I was a youth pastor... He was, he was loved to debate. He was a Christian. And he was always uh, trying to get his friends in arguments and tell them why they're wrong. And he's like, I don't understand, Pastor Jeff. I prove them wrong every time. But nobody comes to faith. I'm like, well, <laughs> nobody likes to be proven wrong every time. In fact, Paul says in Romans, it is the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. The best opportunity we have to show people the love of God and the grace and to win them is through Kindness. Not by telling them how right we are and how wrong they are. And then he says, humility. Humility is a proper view of yourself in light of God. If humility, actually, biblically speaking, is not your thoughts and feelings. It's not walking around going, I'm, I'm, so, I'm low, I'm a wretch, I'm no good. It, it means to act with humility. To act in such a way that you put others ahead of yourself. That's true humility. In fact, this is interesting. The Greek word, tapenos, uh, in classical Greek, was not a virtue. It was seen as a negative thing. To have tapenos meant, you, a little word literally means low. Who wants to be low? I aspire to be low. I aspire to be the bottom. 
Nobody does. In fact, it was viewed that way. This is a problem in society. The ancient Greeks did not uh, aspire to that. They did not see it as a virtue until the Christians came along because Jesus said the first will be last. The greatest will be least. It took Christ to make humility fashionable. In other words, something worth putting on. And then it becomes a list of virtues. Meekness. I got to tell you, when I was playing college football and wrestling, meekness was not something that was like put on the wall to aspire to. Go out there and be really meek today. Right? We thought of it as weakness. That's not what it means. It means strength under control. It means power under the control of the Holy Spirit. Patience. Long-suffering. Greek word makrothemia, meaning you, you're willing to bear much for the sake of Christ. And then he has this great line here. He says, uh, bearing, whoops, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. By the way, this phrase, one another and each other, these phrases, the, there's a lot of one another's in scripture. I want you to notice something. You can't, do, you can't put on any of the things Paul is talking to us about in isolation. Can you put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and forgiveness by yourself? No. It requires relationship. Paul's talking to a community of faith, to a church. He's saying you must put these things on, and the only way you do that is in relationship to one another. And I notice this, bearing with one another. Who's the one another? Class. Look around the room for a minute. You are the one another's. Put up with annoying church people. <laughs> Bear with disagreeable people in the family of God. And by the way, there are some. And you are one of those. And so am I. It doesn't, it, what, you see what Paul's saying? Like, put on these things and let it be evident in the way you love each other as the family of God. Because you've been chosen, holy, set apart, loved, Treat one another with kindness and compassion and gentleness and meekness and patience and bear with each other. It means when somebody does something that just annoys you, which I know never happens in this church, but I've heard some churches can be, or you just don't understand why they would say that or think that or behave that way. Maybe you're in a small group together and you're like, oh, here she goes again. Or maybe you're in, you're, you're, you serve together and this person, you hope you don't have to be near them. Remember what Christ has borne for you. Remember what Paul says? We are being renewed. So we are made new and we're being renewed. And the process of being renewed takes time and it's messy and we don't get it right. Paul is saying, view each other the way God views you as beloved, but a work in progress. Give each other grace. Bear with one another. Forgive each other quickly because you have been forgiven so much. And last, he says in verse 14, and put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Like the belt, right? The sash. It, it, like, it, it perfectly holds together the outfit. It's really encompassing all that he's been saying. Because these things we're to put on are not a list of uh, virtues that you can pick and choose from. It's one seamless garment, the character of the Lord Jesus, we're to live with, held together in love. Jesus put it this way in John 13, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you are really smart and know the Bible. No, if you love one another. That's how the world will know. So we have a new identity. We have new clothes in keeping with our identity. And last, we have a new power. I did not really see this until talking with our, our preaching team this past week on Thursday morning. We meet every Thursday morning, all the, those of us who preach across all the campuses and talk and pray about the text. And something jumped to my attention, Pastor Brian pointed out. I want you to see this. This new power is evident in the scriptures, verses 15 through 17. Uh, there's a couple phrases here which really I think are powerful. Paul says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. And then he says again, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Two times he says, let this happen. That's a really interesting phrase. Let the peace of Christ rule in you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. In other words, allow it to happen. This is what God is doing. Don't resist it. Partner with him in it. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. We have, we have a partnership. We, we are cooperating with the work of God in our own lives. Let the peace of Christ rule. I mean, there's a choice to be made. To be ruled by the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, or by the world, by the culture, by our own anxieties, by our own fears. Allow these things to happen. These two things go together, by the way. I don't think it's possible for the peace of Christ to rule in your heart if the word of Christ isn't dwelling in your life richly. There they go together. If you want the peace of Christ, and peace doesn't mean like an inner peace, a sense of serenity, like serenity now. Like I just feel always at peace. I'm never, I'm, I'm totally chill all the time. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, remember what we, our memory verse? Making peace by the blood of his cross. In Ephesians chapter two, he himself is our peace. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That comfort, that assurance, that security can never be taken from you. And that's what allows you to go through whatever's happening in the world. Great loss, great uncertainty, great difficulty with a sense of peace. Because I know where I stand before God. I know where I am ultimately. Let that assurance and comfort and freedom rule in your life. Don't be ruled by the, by the economic fluctuations, by what somebody said to you at work, by the fear about the next election, by your kid's future, or fears about it, right? We, all kinds of anxieties and fears can rule us. And Paul says, let the peace of Christ, which you already have, rule. And let the word of Christ, his word, dwell in you richly. Those things go together. He's made peace for us. And then he goes on, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This is fascinating to me. I, 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 this is, I hope you see this. We are to teach one another in all wisdom, teach and admonish, to instruct and warn each other. We think, well, that's the word of Christ, right? We need God's word. So it's not just my job as a pastor, it's our job as a community of faith to instruct one another, to encourage one another, and occasionally to challenge and warn one another by the word of God. That's a good and loving thing to do. But then he says, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This is not a separate topic now. This is part of the same thought. When we worship God, too many of you think that, I remember the guy who came to me one time, he's new to the church, he said, I like the message, I like the talks, he said, but I could do without all the singing. I was like, oh, well. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of what we're doing. When we come here and lift our voices in song, we are doing this. Remember what Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is? It's an ancient hymn that they would have sung to remind each other. So when we lift our voices in song, when you come to worship, we're both praising God and proclaiming him to one another. Many, many times I've been instructed by somebody else's worship. Many times I've been challenged, encouraged, even rebuked. I can tell you that just a few weeks ago, I came into this very room for our D group graduation. The, all the students in high school in the D groups were, were, were sharing faith stories about their, what God had done in their life over the course of this last year. They were worshiping together. I stood in the back with my wife and I was overcome with emotion and I felt convicted. Here are these students praising God. And sometimes I'm, I'm too distracted, too full of myself. Teach and admonish one another by the word of God in your worship. So it's his word and our worship that we, we proclaim. You, in other words, you, you have a role to play here. The way you worship God with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs is saying something to God and to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a really powerful thing. Last, he uses this phrase three times. You probably noticed it. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He says, and be thankful. 
Three times in three verses, Paul reminds us about gratitude. Gratitude is to be the distinguishing mark of the Christian life. Full of gratitude and joy. Somebody asked me right at the doors before this service, it was an interesting question. Pastor Jeff, why do you love the Lord? I'm like, uh. <laughs> Great question. Because if I stop and think about it, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude for all that he's done. I don't deserve to be a pastor. You don't deserve to be called sons and daughters of the king. You didn't earn it. But we are chosen, holy, and beloved. At all times, we should be full of gratitude. And you can make a choice to be thankful. You can choose to focus your mind on all that you have in Christ or to focus on all the things you think you lack or you worry might go sideways. Finally, verse 17 ties it all together. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Did you catch that? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything, whatever and everything. What does that leave out? Nothing. What does it mean to do everything in the name of Jesus? Did you take out the trash? Jesus, 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 recycling, cut the recycling, Jesus. You know, how, what does it mean to do everything in the name of Jesus? I have a friend who writes 3 colon 17 on post-its, puts them on his dashboard, on his mirror, on his desk at work, because he wants to remember everything to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. What it means is that all of your life is lived under his sovereign grace and rule. Here's how Abraham Kuyper puts it. Abraham Kuyper was the prime minister of, of the Netherlands and a, a Dutch reformed theologian and pastor. And looks a little uptight. But, he, but he's a great, brilliant thinker. Whatever man may, wherever man may stand, whatever he may do, to whatever he may apply his hand, in agriculture, in commerce, in an industry, or his mind, in the world of art and science, he is in whatsoever it may be, constantly standing before the face of God. He is employed in the service of his God. He has strictly to obey his God. And above all, he has to aim at the glory of his God. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. I love that line. There is not one square inch of your life, your existence, to which the Lord Jesus does not say, mine. And that's not to make you feel guilty, but it's to say, he, you're his. His name is on you. So you, what it means then is to think, is what I'm about to say or do, do I want Jesus' name on that? Because if you belong to him, it is on that. Do everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's read this passage together and I'll pray. This last verse. Ready? And whatever you may do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord Jesus, you have done everything for us. We don't deserve it. You love us because you love us. You chose us because you've chosen us. You've set us apart and called us your beloved, and we don't deserve that. We could never earn it. But that's who you are, and that's who we are in you. And all of our life belongs to you. You've written your name on our hearts, and our names are written on your heart. And therefore, everything, every word and every deed we do ought to be done in your name. We acknowledge we fall short of that. We mess that up. We live for ourselves. We get it wrong. But you're so gracious and so kind. So help us to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, to bear with each other and to put on love above all and to do everything in your name. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. We just learned in Colossians 3, 16 that we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and in so doing to teach each other. And if you think about that song, how good is he is both a question and a declaration. He's good. He is good. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace and goodness of the Lord Jesus. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do everything in his name, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And go in peace.